Today we're going to move from uh, dealing with difficult people to responding to our difficult people. Yeah, I talked to the safety and service team and we thought we'd kind of coordinate this together. There are difficult people here, yes, at church, but they're difficult people in your life. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because if I ask how many of you have difficult people in your life, the people who don't raise their hands are usually the difficult people. <laughs> so just think what a difficult person is like. There's somebody that's angry all the time. There's somebody that likes to argue. Somebody that's kind of mean, that's miserable wherever they go. They might be vain, they might be vile, they might be vulgar. It just seems like they're constantly stirring up trouble. They drink too much, they say too much, they demand too much, they push you too much. They're just too much. A lot of difficult people, if you have them in your life, what we often do is we walk around them. Just at the 4th of July, you had a difficult person show up at your house and and you did your best to kind of just keep avoiding them all day long. Or maybe it's that neighbor that's a difficult person. And you see them walking up your driveway. And you go, oh, no, pretend we're not home. It's someone here at church. And then the Turtle Lake Cafe, you decide you don't need a donut that day. You see, there are difficult people all around us. Some are in our family. You live with them. So some are your friends. And you choose to, to be friends. And still they're difficult. Sometimes it's neighbors or it's people at work, at school, on your team, it's a coach, difficult people. So how do we respond to them? I want to just give you just quickly today, I only have about 20 minutes, just talk just briefly at a high level. This is just going to be a beginning maybe to whet your appetite, give some thoughts. My goal would be after today, you just think of some areas where you need to begin for yourself in dealing with difficult people. I actually think the first thing you need to do is identify who that is. So in your life, who might that difficult person be? Now, if they're sitting next to you, don't look at them right now, okay? Just don't. But if you have a difficult person in your life, I would just encourage you to just identify who that is. Because I think it would be helpful as we do this talk together that you think of someone specifically that you have to deal with on an ongoing basis. How would I respond to them? How, how is it they impact my life in such an adverse way? How could I turn that around? So who would that be? To think of who that face is. And then I want you to change the label and put over them extra grace required. That, that's kind of my AKA, okay? When I think of a difficult person, I say, that's an extra grace required. That's an EGR person on the staff. If I ever say, that's an EGR person, if I'm talking about you, that means you need extra grace. You got a little caution tape around you. And when we approach you and see you, we just want to pour out more grace, more grace, more grace. Grace, grace, grace. And some of you know people that need extra grace. You do. And when I think about that, extra grace is required. In other words, they require extra grace. But I want to go one step further. Not only is it required for them, it's required of you. As a follower of Jesus, we who've received and experienced the grace of God, we're to overflow with that with other people. It's not something we keep. Freely we've received, Freely we give. And you say, where is that in the scriptures? Well, let me give you some of the, the great spokesmen of scripture. Paul, who wrote a majority of the New Testament, says this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. If you have a difficult person who loves to do evil to you, don't repay them, but rather be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, that's just not people pleasing. It's saying, do what is right. What's expected and more. And then I love this, as far as it depends on you. Now, now some people won't let you build a relationship with them. Some, some people have just decided to break that relationship. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And not some, not the people you like, not, not Norwegians or Swedes. Everyone. And I think this is just a marvelous verse. But you say, that's the Apostle Paul. Paul, Paul didn't understand my life. Well, let's listen to Peter. Peter said this, do not repay evil with evil. In other words, there's a difficult person in your life who loves to give evil or insult you. Don't insult them back. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. When someone goes out of their way to hurt or harm you, attack or injure you, bless them. This, this sounds crazy, but this is what you were called to. As a Christian, you weren't called to this easy life of following Jesus and just worshiping. You're called to make a difference in difficult people's lives. And how do you do that? By blessing them. And then you inherit a blessing. There's something about giving the blessing away to bless difficult people where the blessing comes back. 
So think about those people in your life that are difficult. Can, can you choose to bless them, not curse them? Can you choose to do what is right in the eyes of, of God? And, and then you say, but this is Paul and Peter. What about Jesus? Well, you know, I'm going to hit you with the heavy one here. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, I don't think he's just talking about heaven. He's talking about every day in your life. Blessed are the peacemakers. They're the people that come and make peace. I, I love the staff here at Plymouth Covenant. We get along so well. And one of our favorite days is staff meeting on Tuesday, and we have lots of fun. And this past week, um, if you know Pastor Aaron, he just likes to just dig sometimes. Have you ever noticed that? He just won't let some things go. And, and, and Pav, our, our good Bulgarian, doesn't like being pestered. So you got somebody who doesn't like to be pestered and some that could be, uh, you know, Aaron Pesterfelty, okay? And, and so they're sitting there together and, and he's trying to do something on, on a computer and, and Aaron is just hassling him and hassling him and hassling him. And I'm watching this and it was just so evident that all of a sudden, Bob stepped between them. He was fascinating. Not that no, Pav wasn't getting angry or anything like that, but he just glided between them as a peacemaker. I don't know if Bob even knew he did that. It was just one of those natural responses on his part. He is a peacemaker. And I think that's our task in life. When there is a difficult person in our system, God calls you and I to come and be the peacemaker. And listen to what Jesus says. He says, turn your cheek. If they strike you, turn the other one. If they ask for your pants, give them your coat. If they ask you to go a mile, go another mile. To give to those that ask. Whenever they ask, give to them. Love your enemies. What he's saying is so radical. And if you apply that to that difficult person, I've taken away every excuse you have to just mistreat them. Difficult people, we need to be peacemakers. So extra grace is required of me, of you. If you're with me today, God expects you to show extra grace. And there are people around you that need extra grace. They're EGR people. So I'm going to give you five simple responses. Five simple responses of what that extra grace looks like. So EGR, what are the extra grace responses that we could do? The first is this. It's just so simple. I think we forget it. Speak life, not death words. I, I, I agree. We have to listen, and we're going to talk about that non-anxious presence in a moment. But, but before we do, I just want to say first and foremost, be careful what you say. Out of the mouth of men is where most of the trouble begins. What do you say? If Proverbs, and we're going to look at Proverbs. If, if we want wisdom on how to respond, I'm just going to look at the, the wisest man, Solomon, and ask him. He says this, be careful. The tongue has the power of life and death. Out of your mouth is life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, if you use words carefully, if you speak words of life, life will come back to you. A lot of relationships look like the left. But we who follow Jesus should speak words of life on the right. Do you do that? Or do you kind of stoop to a, another person's level? You know, Carson used the word escalate. It becomes louder and louder. Do you escalate with other people? Do, do you find yourself joining in? You know, it's amazing how people bait us with comments. And, and if you think of a lot of the difficult people in your life, oftentimes it's the conversations that can be so difficult. It seems like they just always devolve. They never reach the point. And it's so hard. So I want to first of all just say, be careful of what you say, what comes out of your mouth. It goes on, I love this, it says in Proverbs 12, 18, now if you're dyslexic, that really works, 18, 21, 12, 18, I like that. Okay, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. In other words, I didn't mean to, Dan. It just seems like those difficult people, I never mean to hurt them, but it just comes out. I, I never mean to say that, and, and whenever you're with that difficult person, it just seems like there's this stuff that just comes out of you. And what Solomon is saying is this, it, it, even if you don't mean to, it still cuts, it still separates, it, it still causes death. So be careful, because if you're reckless with your words, it's going to cause the relationships, especially with difficult people, to become more difficult. I love both of these have promises that if you speak words of life, you'll eat its fruit. You will have life. And if you speak words carefully, your tongue of the wise will bring healing, not hurts. So watch what you say. I, I have this, and you've seen me say this before. It's just so important. Before you speak, before you speak, ask this. Think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? What would happen if you would just think 
before you speak? What would happen if you just are slow to speak and quick to listen? What would happen if you just stopped and said, is this true? Is this helpful? Is this inspiring? Is this necessary? Is this kind? If not, then don't say it. So that's the first thing. Speak life words, not death words. Secondly, get curious, not furious. You know they've got a new movie called Planet of the Apes? I, I have a new ad for them. I think they should do this. They should take a picture of a menacing monkey and put an ad on the bottom. Furious George, no longer curious. I like that. I, I don't think it'll go well. No. Well, anyway, I thought that was really cute because we like a curious George, but a lot of us are furious. If I were to think about you, are you more furious than curious? What do I mean by this? Let, let me just explain really quickly. I think all of us tend to move towards furious when people infringe upon our rights, when people attack us, confront us, when we feel like we have an adversary. There's something that just swells up within. Just this last week, and this is going to be a confession. I hope you still love me when I'm done. But I'm driving my car, and I'm going up towards Maple Grove, and I'm pulling off by the... Uh, Oh, where was it? On 30 up there. And I'm pulling off. And, and as I pull off, I'm kind of, I'm not on my phone, but I'm distracted. I'm just thinking about things, about who I'm going to talk to. And, and I'm sitting there, and it's a right turn, and it's a lot of traffic on the road. And I'm going to turn right. And, and I didn't see that the lane you could turn into was kind of like a merge lane. It was actually a separate lane that you came over. But it was so many cars that I didn't pull out. And the guy behind me dared to honk. Honk, 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 honk. I have to tell you, from relaxed to boiling in a second. Now, I'm not an angry kind of guy. Some of you are angry people. You're always on the edge. I'm not. I, I, I really don't mind. But it just got me. For some reason, don't you know? You know, the, oh, you misjudged me. I'm a good driver. Wait a second. What are you in such a hurry for? I could get killed here. And all these things in just a split second. And I was furious. I wanted to back up and hit him with my bike carrier. I mean, I went from just stable and peaceful to furious in a split second. That's all of us. I, I don't know. Every one of us can do that. And I should have pulled over and reflected on some Bible verses. I should have just stopped and listened to KTIS for a second. I should have just turned off my engine. Not, not in front of him. It would have been, I would have felt good, but I, I shouldn't have done that. Just pulled off and been curious not fear. I, I got to tell you that this is how bad it can be. So I pull out in my lane, and he's going around, like, and he's got this, and it's a SUV, and he's around me, and he's going, and I pull behind him <laughs> just for a second. And, and there's a part of me that just wanted to follow him, pull into his driveway and say, huh, you didn't merge there. I, I mean, you just get furious. Now, that lasted for maybe five seconds, but I still remember it today. Emotions aren't necessarily bad. In fact, the word emotion, I think, are good. They move us. Even, even anger. I think there's places where we should get angry. It's interesting. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, in your anger, do not sin. You're going to get angry, but don't sin. Become curious instead. That's, that's what I think. I love what Solomon says. He says, very simply, a fool is quick-tempered. He, he becomes furious instantly, but a wise person stays calm. And how do you stay calm? I'm just going to suggest you do what I'm going to do. Get curious. Start asking yourself questions. So what's going on with that man back there? Why, why is he in such a hurry? Maybe his baby's sick. Maybe he has to run home and take care of something. Maybe his toilet's overflowing right now. Maybe he just got fired from work. Maybe he's just a bad driver. Why? Is this going on? And just be curious and try and live with some empathy for a moment and think about what's going on in his life or, or maybe think about it from God's perspective. Be curious. God, what are you teaching me in all this? That I need to be more focused when I'm driving, yes. That I need to be appreciative of the people around me. That I have these emotions that so quickly move in me. Why do you give them to me, God? And all of a sudden I'm focusing on God, not on him. And I'm curious about God, what, what he's doing. Oftentimes with difficult people, you have to understand, like that oyster, they're, they're, they're irritant, making a pearl inside of you. God, God, what kind of pearl are you producing in my life because of this difficult person? And we've become curious about what's going on. And then I, I think it's just really important to stop and be curious about God. God, how, how would you respond to this? What would you do? 
And I find that curiosity helps us understand the bigger picture. There's so many things going on. And what you have to understand, when you come into the life of a difficult person, you are just a part of this chapter of their life. And there's all these other chapters that have gone on before. And you don't understand all the things that have happened in their life. And it doesn't excuse the way they respond. It doesn't give them an excuse to do the things they do. No, 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 no. But by understanding, by being curious, you can know how to approach them and and work with them. And Pastor Bob has a marvelous talk about regulating your emotions. And that's what it's talked about. When, when you feel angry, when you feel these emotions, how do you deal with them? And, and I just encourage sometimes, if you're struggling with this, especially with anger issues, to talk with him. How do I deal with this anger in my life or with angry people in my life? You know, at my house the other day, I had my granddaughters were in the bathtub and they had poured in a whole bottle of bubble bath. And you just kind of lose the kids in the tub. They're in there giggling, and all of a sudden I go in there, and they're gone. And this bubbles are up over their head, and they're just having this great time. And, and when it was time to let them go and find out if they're still truly in the tub, we let the water out. And, and then something happened. If you're a plumber here today, you could, you, you'd get a kick out of this. I was sitting with Mike back there. You, you'd get a kick out of this. All of a sudden, when the water went out of the tub, the toilet down in my basement started gurgling. I'm sitting there with my wife in the living room, and I hear, and there's air coming out of my toilet. And all of a sudden, I think, oh, no, a big plumbing bill, what's going on? And so I sent my wife to Google, you know, our plumber, and I said, find out what's going on. And, and it said, if your air vent is blocked, air could come up your toilet. All the bubbles filled up my air vent so badly <laughs> that there was no way for it to go, so it came up my toilet. As soon as the bubbles had popped, the toilet worked perfect. All these things are connected. My plumbing, it's all connected. And so are people's lives. And for me, the curiosity is to see how connections with people work out, connections with their past work out, to understand those connections. I had a good friend, and she was struggling with her mother. She just got furious whenever she was with her mother. Her mother just always pushed her, and it was just one of those experiences she didn't ever want to see her mother. And she actually read a book about irregular people, and she shared it with me. She said, the best thing I learned was this. Oftentimes, you can go and get a discount. You ever buy a shirt that's kind of irregular? You can buy them, right? They just got one arm a little bit longer, and if you got one arm that's longer, it fits perfect for you, but nobody else, right? Or, or they got pants that are a little different. In irregular clothes, you can buy them. But when you put them on, they're never going to look regular. You can't make them look regular because there's something wrong with them. To be honest, all of us are irregular. <laughs> uh, there's something wrong with you. And if I expect you to be exactly the perfect person that I want you to be, it's not going to happen. She, she basically saw this. I love this statue. And, and, and you look at the statue, there's something missing in somebody. And to be curious to say, you know, why are they responding to me the way they're responding? There's something missing in their life. I'm not saying become a psychoanalyst or a therapist. I'm just saying to be curious about the people that make you furious. To stop and think, oh God, what is it in their life I can pray about? To turn this on. Is this easy? No, this is a practice, a discipline you have to develop. And when I get furious, to stop and count to 10. My mom taught me that. To stop and count to 10. To let the adrenaline pass. And then become curious. So my goal is, first of all, to say, am I speaking words of life or of death? Secondly, am I becoming more curious or furious? Thirdly, cover, not stir up trouble. I love my fire pit in my backyard. I think every man was created a pyromaniac. Don't you think? I just love burning stuff. I got trees. I'm cutting down trees in my yard. I'm, I'm burning things. I just was informed by one of our firemen here that I can't burn garbage in there, so I don't do that anymore. But I just love burning things. But when it's burning, you, you notice you got to get a poker stick. And I sit at the edge, and I'm poking the sticks and poking the logs and adding more sticks and making a big fire. There's something in me that likes to stir it up. When it comes to difficult people, there's something in you that wants to stir it up. No, no, you say, no, 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 not me. No, no, there's something in us that keeps adding timbers to the fire, the quarrels, the arguments, the disputes. We keep adding fuel to the fire, and then we stir it up. You'll find many passages in the book of Proverbs about this. It just says, hatred starts fights, but love puts a quilt over the bickering. It covers it. It puts it out. Isn't that a good word? A gentle response diffuses anger, but a sharp tongue kindles a temper fire. And some of us with our sharp tongues, our life, 
we just take something that begins to just, and it ignites and it grows. Somebody just asks, do you put fires out or do you get them going? I love the story of the, I don't love the story, but it's a good story about a couple. They were arguing one morning. Somebody had left something out overnight and it had spoiled on the cupboard and, and she said he did it and she said he said she did it. And, no, he, she said you did it. And no, he said you did it. And she said you did it. And he said you did it. And she, you did it. And, and he's leaving to go to work and the last thing he did is open the door. You did it! He goes to work and he had packed the lunch and he sat down at noon to eat his lunch and he opened it up and there's a little note and it said, no, you did it. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. Some of you are in those arguments right now with the people you love. And you win the argument and lose somebody you love. What's the sense of that? You keep adding fuel to this ongoing difficult relationship. Stop. If we would just step up and stop. Stop adding fuel to the fire. Many of the questions, the, the quarrels would end around us. Because it takes two to fight. Seek reconciliation, not revenge. Seek reconciliation, not revenge. Most people think revenge is sweet. And when you have a difficult person, you just want them to understand how you feel. I know that. You want them to have some payback. I was hoping the guy, when he passed me, would get pulled over by a policeman. That was my desire. I mean, I mean, we have these things inside that say, I just hope they understand and feel. That's revenge. And we often take it in our own hands. You hear the story of the little boy, little girl. Mom was in the kitchen working, and she heard the crying in the living room, and she went in, and here's the little boy crying. She said, what's wrong? She said, he said, well, my little sister, she pulled my hair, and it hurt. And the mom came alongside and said, I understand, it does hurt, and I'm sure your little sister just doesn't know how it feels. You just have to forgive her and go on. She doesn't know how it feels. So she went back into the kitchen, did her work. All of a sudden, she heard another cry. Went into the living room. Here, the little girl is crying. The little boy looked at her and said, she knows now. <laughs> don't, don't we want people just to feel our pain? And so when a difficult person has hurt you, has done something, you, you just, in some ways, are just praying, could they just understand my pain? And in many ways, that's the revenge. And, and, and friends, I don't think that's fair. It's not right. We, we can't do that. You know, very clearly, the Bible says, do not say, I will pay you back, for this is wrong. Wait for the Lord. He will avenge you. Justice will happen. You have to just trust God for that. You have to be patient with that. You can't take it into your own hands. Revenge is not sweet. It's the pits. It really is. And that's why you have to work on this. In fact, I want to just push you and say, as a follower of Jesus Christ, something has happened in your life. And I just love this passage. And this is a passage some of you need to write down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, then a new creation has come. You're a new person. You're not the same person you used to be. Things have changed. There's been transformation in your life. And since the old is gone, the old and what people have done in your past, that's gone. The new is here. And what is the new? This is from God. He's reconciled you to himself through Jesus. And he's now given you a ministry. Your ministry is to reconcile people. Not to show revenge, but to reconcile. So I just want to say, is it up to you? Yeah, yes. This is your ministry. And God has given this to you. And the difficult people in your family, your friends, your, your world, God has called you to seek to reconcile them as much as it depends on you. Last of all, set and honor boundaries. Now, I can't talk about this very long, just very quickly. This was a word that came up in the 90s. Henry Cloud, if you've read any of his books, if you haven't, you need to do this. And very simply, let me say what this is. Boundaries are not written to keep people out. I think that's, that's the mistake we often make. I, I, I set boundaries to keep people away from me. No, 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 no. A proper boundary allows people to come near. But it differentiates what's yours and what's theirs. Who you are and who they are. I could give you a couple passages that are in the scriptures, but there's quite a few. I love this one. Do not set your foot in your neighbor's house too much or they'll hate you. You've got to start recognizing their boundary. So, so let me talk just about the word codependency for a second. We throw that around. That's a word we just toss around so much. It's just psychobabble. But what codependency for me is, is where you no longer know who you are. You've lost the boundary of your life. And you're so enmeshed in the life of another 
that you don't know who you are and where your responsibilities start and end. Do you know what difficult people like to do? They like you to take responsibility for their life. Difficult people like you to be responsible for their happiness and joy. Difficult people want to take what's yours and make theirs. And a boundary person sets a clear boundary with, with honest consequences. No, no, this, this, this is who I am. I believe in interdependency. I need to be connecting with people. But I need to know who I am in Jesus. My identity and the way Christ has made me. And if I know who I am, and there's a boundary clearly around that identity, then people are allowed to come near. I'm not afraid of building relationships and, and even being vulnerable with people because I know who I am. It's very clear in my life. Proverbs 22, if I want to just tell you what that means, it says, do not make friends with hot-tempered people. In other words, if you find yourself connected with people that are difficult, hot-tempered people, you may learn their ways, and you may get yourself ensnared. That's codependent. They just suck you in. So sometimes you have to have a clear boundary. This can be difficult. I, I had a young lady that was a good friend, and she had a very abusive husband in, in words, in emotional abuse. Constantly, she could never ever clean the house enough. She could never take care of the kids correctly. She never looked pretty enough. And he would come home and he would get angry. And if he drank, it got worse. And she came to me, a young, young girl just following Jesus. What do I do? And we talked about how you set boundaries. And I said, you can't let him swear at you. You, you just can't let him use those words with you. You just can't. That's not good for him. It's not good for you. And so she developed a plan. When he started swearing and getting angrier, she'd say, you can't talk to me that way. Well, that would make him madder. And she actually would have to excuse herself and leave the house. And then eventually he'd cool down and she'd come back. This took a long time. This, this wasn't overnight. But as she set these boundaries and he learned that she clearly understood who she was and, and what their relationship should look like, he responded. And, and they fell in love again. And it changed. It, was it easy? It was hard. Setting boundaries are difficult. Sometimes it's just easy to give up, give in, go along. And we need to stop and say, no, this is who God has called me to be. And I love you, but you can't treat me that way. And that can be a difficult conversation. So here are five responses. But let me just stop by saying this. For you to respond this way, you first of all have to receive extra grace. I can't do this. There's nothing in me that allows me to get along with difficult people. I would become furious, argumentative, speak death words, stir up the fire. I, I would do that, but if I've stopped, and that first step is to receive the grace that Jesus provides. And for some of you, that's where you need to begin today. You're difficult. You might not know it, but you're difficult. And you need to first of all say, God, I receive the grace that you have for me today. Transform me from the old to the new. Oh, God, I, I want to speak life words like you've spoken over me. You've spoken life into me. Oh, God, I want to learn what it means to just cover sin and, and not stir it up. Oh, God, I don't want to be furious anymore. The anger in me is just taking my life. I want your grace. And he gives it to you freely. I just love this picture. And Ephesians 4, just, just meditate on this. Every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Extra grace received. Thank you. It's out of that overflow of his grace that I can deal with difficult people. Romans chapter 5, I just, uh, this verse just so, so helps me. God demonstrates his love for me. And while I was an enemy of God, he still died for me. I needed extra grace. I was an enemy to God. And, and as a sinner, I wanted nothing to do with who God was. But he continued to pursue me and love me and demonstrated that love by giving me the greatest gift of all, his son Jesus, that extra grace that I so required. And I just want to say for some of you today, that's where it begins. I, I've been trying to deal with difficult people on my own, God. I can't do it. I need your grace. I receive it. Help me now reconcile even with hard people. Let me pray for you. Father God. We've touched on a very difficult subject very quickly today. There are difficult people in our life. And God, I'm so glad that you placed us as followers of Jesus in their path. And I pray that we might love them with an unconditional love, that we might show an extra grace that's beyond our own ability. And I pray that people around us might recognize, oh God, make us curious about how we can better love 
the people that are difficult right now. Help us to respond to them with words and actions that, that honor you. And God, if we are difficult in any way, sh show that to us. Reveal that to us. Because each and every one of us struggle in certain areas. We have empty spots like that statue, God. Could you fill them with your grace today? Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.